Um, hopefully everybody else can. Um, well, Carol's going to kind of take us through um, some of the images that were used in the book, and you all will get a chance to ask her questions. But um, she's very excited. This is her first webinar, and um, I'm going to let Carol tell a little bit about herself, and then she can start talking about the images you're about to see. Hi, I'm Carol, and uh, it's a really uh, great pleasure and privilege to be with all of you today. Um, first of all, before we plunge into any images, there are there are nearly 400 images in the book itself. Uh, I just want to tell you something about this project and how I got involved in it. Uh, I, I am an author, a writer, and historian myself who knew very little about transportation history before I started researching this book. I was asked to write this book by Roger Polson, who uh, is a retired TxDOT employee um, who was intent on commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Texas Highway Department, known now, of course, as TxDOT, uh, with a complete history. And when he first proposed the project to me, I was sort of hesitant because A, I'm not an engineer. And B, I was thinking, hmm, uh, a history of asphalt. Oh, I'm just not terribly excited. But then I realized what a fascinating opportunity this would be to tell the history of Texas through the lens of infrastructure. Because, of course, without infrastructure, there is no progress. And without everything that you guys do, there essentially is no Texas as we know it. So uh, I, got, I got very excited about um, the scope of a project like this and what it meant um, uh, for, the, for, for designating an entire history of the region that we live in. So uh, I immediately plunged into research, and the first chapter of this book deals with uh, not just 400 years of Texas history pre-highway department, but millennia of history in terms of uh, where our roads originally came from, like game trails, and uh, before that, Mastodon and Woolly Mammoth trails, and and uh, you know, the game trails established by Native Americans in pursuit of, of uh, animals um, to eat and how those particular road systems, those early tracks and trails, covered ground in the most intelligent way possible because they were like early surveyors. They Game uh, or animals would choose the easiest route across a landscape and one with the most resources of food and water. So um, it just made a lot of sense that so many of our highways now, our, our present day I-35, et cetera, are based on those very early trails. And I also got very interested in the engineering of early roads, especially uh, in Central America, South and Central America, the Great Incan Road and the Mayan Roads um, that were constructed through the jungles of the Yucatan uh, and beautifully constructed, I might add, with, with um, graduated rock systems and a sheathing of uh, a limestone cement that were very, very straight and, uh, of course, meant only for pedestrian traffic because there were no um, uh, pack animals in that part of the world at the time and no wheeled vehicles, therefore, except on toys. So uh, I had a lot of fun researching all of that and then coming up to the establishment of the uh, Texas highway system uh, in an official capacity. Once the uh, Texas Department of Highways was established, in 1917, as a as the result of the Federal Road Aid Act of 1916, somebody figured out after a lot after years of controversy in the legislature, somebody figured out that that 
according to the um, basis of the uh, um, tripod uh, formula that the government was using to designate funds to each state, if Texas finally established a highway authority, they were going to get more money than any other state from the feds uh, to fund a project like that. And it was at that point that many years worth of fighting between the legislatures and, and the counties who wanted to maintain control over road systems, each separate county, its own road systems in the state of Texas, all finally consolidated under that system. So that was in part a result of the good roads movement. That first, this photograph that you see right now is of course of a bunch of folks stuck in the mud. And that is what it was like in a large part of the year, surprisingly enough, because we think in terms of drought, but we don't necessarily think in terms of just what the state is like when it is saturated in heavy rains. Um, there, there were farmers all across the state in fair amounts of isolation during the heavy weather months because they couldn't get their goods to market. They couldn't, um, they couldn't even get their kids to school because they get stuck in the mud, quite literally. And so the big um, Good Roads Movement cry, the banner cry was, get the farmer out of the mud. And that is what carry a great deal of weight here in Texas for obvious reasons. So um, the idea was to start improving roads through good engineering, and uh, which included good surveys, of course, and good methodology to uh, make it possible to extricate the farmer from the mud and also make it possible to get goods of all kinds to markets. So that is, this, is a, this photo is a good demonstration of, of just how dire conditions could be. And there are several stuck in the mud photos in the book, some of which are more fun than others. Anyway, this is Congress Avenue. Uh, and as you can see, there are some guys working on the road, which at, that, at the time this photograph was taken was strictly dirt. Uh, you can see the streetcar lines down the center of Congress Avenue and uh, the road widening efforts and the uh, transport of dirt <laughs> because at least up and through uh, until the 1930s, a lot of the tools used by the Texas Highway Department and previous to that, the counties, were uh, mule-drawn carriages, mule-drawn wagons, uh, hand labor, obviously. And there's a really great story about Lyndon B. Johnson and his very, very first job, which the first job he ever had was with the Texas Highway Department. Johnson was born in Johnson City, of course, and his parents, who were educated people, really wanted to make sure that he went to college. And he didn't want to go to college. And he was making a big point of, to them as a teenager when he was 15 and 16 that he absolutely did not want to go to college. And the Texas Highway Department had started building a highway, a decent paved highway between Johnson City and Austin. And he said, I'm going to go out and get a job and prove to you that I can work hard at a job and I don't have to go to college just to satisfy your ambitions for me and your expectations of me, obviously a strong-willed, defiant teenager. So the job that was available to him, as it was to a number of teenagers right there in Johnson City, a summer job, was working for the Texas Highway Department, building this road that would go from Johnson City to Austin. Lyndon spent his first day on the job having to turn the slats underneath the wagon, these big wide wooden slats uh, with handles on the end that would cause the lower layers of rock in the wagon to sift through the slats in a fairly uniform and even manner to put the first layer of gravel down and then larger stones down on the roadway 
from these mule-drawn wagons that would inch their way along the road top. At the end of the day, Lyndon quit his job and said, all right, I'm going to college <laughs> because the work was so hard that he realized that that was going to be his destiny and if, if he didn't comply with his parents' wishes. And uh, it was extremely hard, rugged work. And most of the teenagers in Johnson City continued on through the rest of the summer, including girls, which is interesting because not that many girls traditionally had been or would be in the immediate future employed by the Texas Highway Department. So um, that tells you a little bit about that early equipment. Uh, this is some um, equipment as it evolved to uh, start uh, paving in a more methodical way. When Gib Gilchrist first took charge of the department as the state highway engineer, which was the equivalent of the executive director today, one of the first things he did was to go to Camp Mabry and buy a whole lot of post-World War I surplus army equipment for the highway department. And this included Liberty trucks and um, paving materials, paving equipment, just all kinds of stuff that he could get at a decent cut rate because it was surplus equipment from the Army. And that was essentially the first equipment owned by the Texas Highway Department to start making the job a little easier. I can't remember uh, what year this particular photograph was taken but that is in all likelihood, it looks like that's, that's a hot mix truck, but um, it's in all likelihood some of the equipment that evolved from that first equipment acquisition. And this is uh, our highway commission and a meeting of uh, all of the district officers and with the highway, uh, uh, the head of the highway commission and the commissioners in Mineral Wells, Texas, one of the first meetings of its kind. So, and this is a, uh, a, section, in, uh, a, se a section manager's truck, and you can see it's got its little mascot on there um, during the early days at one of the maintenance facilities, section uh, maintenance facilities. Here is another great stuck in the mud photo you can just imagine what it must be like to have to dig out all those Model Ts time by time. There, there is a, a photograph in the book that's actually one of my favorites. It's taken in East Texas, and it, it's taken in the 1930s on a road that was to be turned into a highway. And it's got these two guys trying to lever a Texas Highway Department vehicle out of red clay mud using stripped pine tree trunks quite hilarious um, and it's in color so I can't remember if it's in this particular batch of photos or not but it's great um, here's a, a road paving effort you can see that these mules are pulling what was then called a split log drag which was this contrivance meant to smooth out the road and it had to be pulled by animals uh, later on its, its equivalent in terms of trucks were used, but it was literally made out of a log that had been split and then attached to a dredge. Uh, it was a dredge log that was attached to a frame that was in turn attached to chains that the mules would pull to try to smooth out the larger bits of rock and uh, lumpy soil to uh, make way. And, uh, as you can see, this is Highway 66, Route 66, so um, that's in there too. That's, this is from the 50s. You can see that. Uh, okay, this is a band at Texas A&M. And the guy with the trombone kneeling is the guy who would later become the longest serving state engineer in Texas and the guy who was responsible for an enormous amount of progress and also integrity in the Texas Highway Department, DeWitt 
C. Greer. DeWitt Carlock Greer. He um, was a student at A&M and, as you can see, a musician. And he wound up serving as the executive director for 27 years. And after that, he uh, was appointed to the Texas Highway Commission. So he served the state of Texas in an executive capacity for a long enough period of time to make sure that the Texas Highway Department was run not only very efficiently, but um, with uh, the greatest amount of thrift. As, as I've been told by a, a very, very stalwart engineer, John Barton, the credo of engineers is an engineer will uh, solve a problem for the, uh, will use, I'm sorry, it'll take him $1 to solve a problem that most people have to solve for $10. DeWitt Greer was a perfect example of that. He was also intent on running the department as ethically as possible, as his longest serving predecessor had done, Gib Gilchrist, who was another phenomenal engineer. He's the guy who bought the, all the equipment from Camp Mabry. And um, uh, my colleague Roger likes to include this particular uh, image. As you can see, it's Dallas. And uh, that's one of the uh, earliest uh, interchanges in downtown Dallas of Elm Street and Main Street and Commerce Street. So. Um, I think this dates back to the 30s or 40s. So, um, more guys on road equipment. <laughs> uh, not so thrilling. Okay, this photograph is an excellent demonstration of why it was so important to uh, construct a consistent road, road system across the entire United States and why in the 50s the interstate system became so essential to construct and before that in the 19 starting in the 1920s some kind of efficient um, and fairly uniform system needed to be incorporated and that was why the Federal Road Act of 1916 specified that a more uniform system state to state needed to be created, which was why they were encouraging each state to found their own highway authority. And that, of course, is the military. It was so important to have for self-defense, for home territory defense, to have a system of roads across the country that heavy military equipment could be moved uh, from state to state on um, because before that there were two military expeditions in 1919 and 1920 that crossed the United States, one on the Bankhead Highway and the other just trying to cross the United States using military equipment, leaving from Washington DC on a southern route that would end up in San Diego, California and leaving Washington DC on DC on a more northern route that would end up in San Francisco. Both of these expeditions proved that the roads across the United States were absolutely hopeless. During one, ex one of these expeditions, which involved tanks and military vehicles of all kinds used at that time, ambulances, um, uh, personnel movers, all kinds of trucks, uh, it was <laughs> It, on one of the expeditions, they had 88 different bridge failures across the country just trying to get across, and then they would have to repair the bridge to get across and move on. Some of these took place in you know, Montana and, and uh, Nebraska, um, all of these states that uh, had hopeless highway systems. And Texas was a little bit better at the time, but not much. So these resulted in this huge map that, when I say huge, I mean it was something like 22 feet long, that was presented to Congress by General John Pershing, and it was known as Pershing's Map, and it pinpointed just how rugged a job it was for the U.S. military to cross the United States and how important it was to make these roads not only passable, but able to support heavy equipment. So this 
photograph demonstrates the result once um, roads like that got implemented across the country. That's what this is about. Okay, that's a smudge pot. Many of you are probably too young to remember smudge pots, but when there was road work on any given uh, highway or road under the aegis of uh, the Texas Highway Department, around the road work they would put saw horses and smudge pots that were kerosene powered on the top, as you can see, that looked like little round bombs with a flame coming out the top, very quaint. Um, and certainly a common sight during my own childhood. Uh, that's Lyndon B. Johnson there in the middle. In the 1930s, after his one disastrous day with uh, the labor force of TxDOT, Johnson became the head of the National Youth Organization that uh, from state to state was responsible for providing depression era youth with good training and good projects. And the projects that he got all of these youths he was in charge of to do was to provide roadside parks and rest areas for um, the great state of Texas along the highways that the highway department at that time were was paving and or constructing and creating. So we have Johnson to thank for a number of really nice roadside parks that he um, got these youths to build, and uh, one in particular that he's famous for. But the irony of it was he was much better at directing other people to put in the elbow grease than he was as a, as a youth himself in, pro in providing elbow grease. So that was that was his deal before he then went on to Washington in uh, the 40s. This is a photograph of a cave that is not far from Austin. It's between Georgetown and Austin, and it's the discovery of um, of oh gosh, I'm liking you. <laughs> uh, the cavern system that Textot in excavating uh, uh, for the highway between Georgetown and Austin, I-35, inner space caverns, discovered, this, this cavern, inner space caverns, was discovered by a guy from TxDOT who then, of course, explode, explored it more thoroughly. And now it's a public feature uh, that can be um, explored by tourists far and wide as they drive that highway. It was quite exciting the day that got discovered. Uh, that's a farm to market road sign being erected. It's, it's because of the farm to market road system here in Texas that a whole lot of rural roads got paved that otherwise would not have been. This was implemented in the 1940s. Uh, and Texas was the first state to develop a farm-to-market road system uh, under the official capacity of the highway department. And it was responsible for uh, making sure farmers everywhere and ranchers everywhere would have access to easy and paved access to um, the cities and uh, nearby towns. Now, it's really interesting because in Texas, everybody's heard of farm-to-market roads, right? Uh, FM 563, as you can see. FM 1, which is in East Texas and was the very first one established. But there's a line that's drawn through the state. And on one side of the line, you get farm-to-market roads. And on the other side of the line, you get ranch-to-market roads. So... Uh, the designation differs on either side of that dividing line. There you go. Um, aha! This sign is talking about the El Camino Real. And El Camino Real was, of course, the road system originally developed by the Spanish when they had um, come up through... Uh, from Mexico City 
up through Mexico into the, the region of Texas, which of course at that time was Spanish owned, in order to establish roadways to their missions, particularly the first two that were established in far northeast Texas, in the Piney Woods, among the Caddo Indians. And they um, developed these roads, right, as you might expect, right on top of the previous byways, throughways that had been established by uh, animals and then by Native Americans. They uh, surveyed those roads and marked them and uh, tried to smooth them and develop them a little bit further because they had to carry uh, ox carts or they had to uh, bring ox carts through on those roads. So there's this whole system of roads in Texas, El Camino Real, and they are historically marked, that you can travel to this day that uh, were roads originally established by the Spanish leading up through San Antonio and uh, a couple of other places in uh, South Texas, up through the state, in particular uh, up into East Texas to serve those missions. Um, and here you have a couple of guys uh, sealing two ends of a highway. There you go. These are the women of the Texas Highway Department early on. This was in the 1920s when um, the main office of the Texas Highway Department and the Vehicle Registration Office and the Driver's License Office were all in the state capitol. And these are the secretaries uh, and people in charge of voter registration who were working there at that time. You can see from the, their outfits, it's all very sort of 1920s hemlines and clothing and hairdos. And one of those women worked there for, gosh, what, nearly 50 years. Um, one thing about Texas Highway Department that's always been so fascinating to me is the longevity of the jobs in it. I've talked with people who have worked for the highway department for 40, 45, 50 years, either in engineering or in maintenance, and I've just never encountered that much dedication and loyalty to one entity in any profession, other than maybe a lawyer with his own law firm or something. But um, boy, you know, I have to salute Engineers have become my new heroes, by the way. Uh, ever since I interviewed a lot of them and uh, studied a lot of their histories to do with this particular uh, state agency, I am just amazed at the minds and the problem-solving abilities and the ways to think about problems and the integrity of engineers. As far as I'm concerned, engineers are it. They're it. But uh, there are maintenance guys in the maintenance division of TxDOT who have also worked there for 50 years and more, and also entire generations. Well, some of these women that you see in this photograph worked for decades and decades for the department. And um, I got to say, there's got to be something really terrific about TxDOT and the Texas Highway Department to compel that kind of loyalty. So, aha, this is the first female district engineer in Texas, Maribel Chavez, whose story is in the book, and it's quite hilarious, and I'm not gonna tell you much about her story right now because I really strongly encourage you guys to read this book. It was a lot of fun to write. It was very interesting to research, uh, and her story in particular, uh, a, a big section of the interview that I had with her is she tells her story and the things that she was up against as the first female district engineer and the things she overcame to achieve the excellent uh, service that she did to the state are really not only inspiring but some quite hilarious. So I'm going to let her story speak for itself. I encourage you all to uh, read the book just to read Maribel's story, if for no other reason. 
Maribel uh, uh, is responsible, uh, is, is at least partly responsible for one of the bridges featured in this book, which was designed by a textile engineer, and we'll get to that in a bit. By the way, if any of you are interested in getting this book, you can order it through Amazon. You can purchase it through my colleague, Roger Paulson, uh, and you can also um, get it through Texas A&M Press and or your local bookstore, so you pick. Here's a, here is a bridge construction. Um, as you can see, there's there's a whole section on bridges at the end of this book. I thought this was uh, uh, oh the repair. Yeah. Now I'm sorry, this this is the repair of the causeway. Oh yes, the causeway. Um, there is a, a whole section on the failure, uh, the collision uh, that led to the failure of the Queen Isabella Causeway at Port Arthur, and also what it's, um, South Texas. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> what did I just say? Did I say Port Port Arthur. Arthur. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have uh, too many places and facts crammed into my noggin at the moment. Yes, in South Texas. Port Isabel. The Port Isabel. I said Port Arthur. <laughs> anyway, um, and I was just talking with Melinda the other day, and she had not been aware that an airplane had previously hit the causeway uh, before this particular collision actually took the causeway out and, and caused a lot of uh, casualties, sadly speaking. This is the repair. Amadeo Sands, who eventually became executive director of TechStot, was uh, the person on the spot in charge of having to figure out a way to provide ferry landings for the ferries and um, other transport systems for the people who needed to get back and forth uh, to and from Port Isabel when this happened. So uh, that's a very interesting story also. And no, it's not true that one bridge looks just like another. I'm sure you all are familiar with this particular bridge, the Pecos High Bridge, which has been replaced no fewer than four times and the whole story of its various failures and why it's so high now is also in the bridge. It's a beautiful structure and a beautiful part of Texas, as you can see. Uh, we've, we have a whole section on just on bridges in the book, and um, that was a lot of fun. So, you know, the, the story of, of the different iterations of this bridge, are all, they're all in the book. So, and... Uh, I'm sure that you can, you guys can tell what this is. So uh, I'm going to let I'm going to let photos of highways that uh, Jeff and Roger has included in here pretty much speak for themselves, and you can see them in the book. This is a, a particularly fabulous bridge. Uh, how many of you have your audios on and can respond to me? I can do it through the chat. Oh, uh, through the chat? Yeah, they would appear. Uh, they could type in something in. Who wants, to, who wants to identify this particular bridge? Anybody? Or they can just say it, too. You can say it, too. You don't have to, you, you don't have to uh, actually type it in. This is Lindsay at the Texas section office. I think I can um, unmute all attendees, perhaps. Um, so let oh, good. I can get that going so that everybody can speak. Or this is my first rodeo, so uh, <laughs> I don't know the text of the way this technically works. I think I can unmute. You. you might have to unmute. Them. Which could be best. You see me and then if you have any questions. Then. Does anybody want to identify this bridge? <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know. It looks like one of um, one of our attendees has said it's the Fred Hartman Bridge, and that. And that attendee would get the prize. That's right. So Fred Hartman. 
Thank you, Roger. Really? Hello? This is Lindsay O'Leary again at the Texas section. I'm going to head and I'm muting the attendees again um, just because there's some background noise on a few lines. So uh, typing in the chat box is definitely the best way to communicate. There's just a number of callers on the line. We have almost 70 attendees on today's webinar. So to keep everybody's static down, we'll let the, the typing be the response from the attendees. Okay, that's, that's, fan, that's fine and dandy. Yes, it is the Fred Hartman Bridge. Now, this bridge, which is one of my favorites in the whole world because I think it's so beautiful, and it is certainly the favorite of the guy who was responsible for its construction, Doug Pickcock uh, of Williams and uh, Brothers Construction. It replaced the uh, Baytown Tunnel. The Baytown Tunnel was the main egress across the bay uh, until the time that the, t that the tunnel was disassembled. Can you uh, switch the... Uh, I don't think we got the tunnel. Oh, no. There's not a tunnel picture in here? Okay. In the book, we have a great picture of the tunnel that got literally taken apart section by section and, and floated out of the bay after this bridge was constructed to, um, to take up uh, the uh, traffic load. And I was crying out. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I remember the year. I worked on the one on the north end and the south end. Hey, guys, I think uh, some of you are unmuted. Are we still muted? Hmm? I hear you. Okay. Okay. Anyway, um, so... Uh, so the tunnel, you know, there aren't very many tunnels in Texas. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. And when I say there aren't very many, I think there are only like three. And one of them is in Big Bend. So I don't know if you can count that one or not. Um, but th that this particular tunnel that went under the bay uh, had a very interesting dismantling process, photos of which you can see in the book. When I was first learning about bridges uh, in order to um, write this book, I had the advantage of a, an entire Sunday afternoon's education with Charles Walker. And Charles Walker is not only a bridge, uh, not only an engineer, but he's an, he is a bridge historian. And he took me through engineering processes through the past century and how various uh, bridges were constructed, what the innovations uh, were that were invented through engineers at the Texas Highway Department slash TxDOT that um, uh, allowed those to be constructed the way they were. It was an absolutely fascinating education. And the fact that Texas also has the highest number of bridges of any state in the United States followed only by, I think, Ohio, um, is, is certainly an important thing to note, 33,000 bridges. Anyway, uh, so this, in my opinion, is certainly one of the most beautiful bridges, but there are a number of really beautiful bridges here now. Uh, and you can see a bunch of them in the book. Anyway, let's, let's go, move on to the next. Okay, you guys may or may not know where this is, but it is a rest area and a viewing area in far west Texas. Uh, I believe this is the one where you can see the Marfa lights. And there's the bats on our very own Congress Bridge here in Austin, uh, which is home to one of the largest uh, uh, Mexican bat colonies in the world. And this is the uh, bridge in Dallas that is also, um, in my opinion, a very beautiful bridge. Uh, it was not, technically speaking, uh, constructed by TxDOT, but it's, it's gorgeous. But I want to get to the 7th Avenue Bridge, uh, or 7th Street Bridge, which is here in Fort Worth, which is uh, a bridge that opened only a couple of years ago. 
I watched it while it was under construction. I would go to Fort Worth periodically and watch the construction of this bridge. It was so interesting, it was designed by a textile engineer and uh, constructed off-site, piece by piece, uh, in a site about a mile and a half from uh, the place where the pieces would be assembled. And it went up uh, astonishingly quickly, considering how um, elaborate it is, replacing the old 7th Street Bridge. So that was a lot of fun uh, to watch. And uh, there is a section in the book called The Evolution of a Bridge that details this point by point. So I think we're going to move on now to the question and answer period. Uh, I have largely ignored a lot of the, I think, fascinating um, political history and early scandal that was associated with um, with the uh, establishment and evolution of the Texas Highway Department. I will just say this. Governor Jim Ferguson, who was our most corrupt governor ever in the history of Texas and was, of course, impeached, um, in 1970, 1917, on April 4th, signed the bill into law that would create the Texas Highway Department. He didn't want to. He didn't like the Good Roads Movement. He didn't believe people should drive over 10 miles an hour, and he absolutely did not see any reason to create a Texas Highway Department until somebody told him how much money we were be going to be getting from the federal government once this was created. When he did that, when he found that out, rather, he uh, immediately signed the bill into law and then suggested to the uh, new highway commissioner uh, at the time, the head of the highway commission, Curtis Hancock, that that money that was going to be coming in from the federal government and through the mode of uh, vehicle registration, the new, newly established uh, Department for Vehicle Registration, be funneled through his own personal bank in Temple, the Temple State Bank, which he owned a large chunk of and which he also owed an enormous amount of money to. And fortunately, Curtis Hancock said to him, well, I believe we have a state treasury for that. That just began Ferguson's and later his governor wife's attempts to siphon money away and scam money off of the Texas Highway Department until Gib Gilchrist, and a couple of other guys came in and said, we're putting a stop to this. This is never going to happen again. But it's a very juicy part of the book that all this political scandal took place and that this guy was determined to sabotage the funds of the Highway Department practically before it got started. Okay, we're going to do some uh, Q&A now. Okay. So, uh, if you have a question, if you can type it into the chat box. And this is Lindsay O'Leary from the Texas Section Office. I see that we do have one question so far from um, Russell Carter. His question is, where is the dividing line between ranch and farm-to-market roads? Aha. Well, it's kind of jagged, but it runs through the hill country, as you might expect. And, um, uh, and it runs from north to south. And you can... Um, you can find the specific towns that it, that it runs through on the book, but essentially, uh, it's is I think Kerrville. Gosh, I'm going to have to look it up now. Um, but but it runs through the hill country on the Edwards Plateau. Okay. Well, Russell, thank you for that question. Is there any other questions? This is Lindsay again from the Texas section. I don't see any additional questions in the chat box, but all attendees um, should have access to the chat box on the control panel, the lower portion. So I don't see any others, but I think perhaps th there may be some that we had from before the presentation. Okay. Um, are those available? I think um, I can fill in for that. Um, 
I think one of the questions was, um, what was like your favorite part of the book? <laughs> My favorite part of writing the book? Oh, gosh. Well, quite frankly, I found the entire process of writing this book fascinating because I was learning an enormous amount, obviously, as I went along. And I was learning about engineering. I was learning about uh, the actual road construction process itself. I was learning about the history of the people behind um, all of it. Uh, as I said, I was learning about all of this scandalous political history that accompanied it. And, and quite frankly, the battle that took place between the corrupt elements of government, i.e. the Fergusons, Ma and Pa Ferguson, and their cronies, and the highway department itself. And, and it was, there was a pitched battle that lasted for about 15 years um, between these two elements. I mean, the Fergusons were people who, at one point, when Ma Ferguson was, was governor, fired all the Texas Rangers. I mean, that's, that's how extreme their... Uh, <laughs> their corruption was and their uh, will to power was and anybody who went against them or objected to them, they tried in every way to get rid of. So, and the Texas Rangers, by the way, at that time were part of the Texas Highway Department. They were, uh, they were in there before the Department of Public Safety got established in the 1930s. So uh, all of these things were under one major umbrella so I found all of those those battle scenes to be really interesting. I can't think of a part of the book that was my favorite to write. I, oh, I will say this. One section I wrote that surprised my colleagues and editors when I first suggested that I write it was the section on crime. There's an entire section on crime in the middle of the book uh, that details a history of crime in Texas and how improved highways have facilitated certain kinds of crime. And it goes all the way from stagecoach robbery and train robbery up through bootleggers and Bonnie and Clyde, who, as many of you might know, made excessive use of the road systems of Texas <laughs> in all of their travels and getaways, on through... Um, uh, more bootlegging in the in the 1930s and 40s from county to county, and then serial killers, human trafficking, the drug trade. There's even a photograph of uh, a truck that was disguised as a TxDOT, um maintenance vehicle, but with with actual numbers on the side and you know painted to look like a Texas. Uh, um, a textot, uh white pickup truck, but it was crammed with bales of marijuana because it was used to transport marijuana by the cartels. And of course, they had fleets of different vehicles that they would that they have used through the years. But it, the irony was, they used a textot vehicle. And some, some TxDOT employee somewhere on some road noticed that the reflectors had been put on wrong on the back of the truck and said, wait, that's not a real truck from TxDOT, that's a fake. So they called it in and this truck was seized. And I mean, there were bales of, of marijuana in the, um, in the bed of the truck, in the utility box, in the rear seat uh, area. It's quite hilarious. So the crime section was a lot of fun to write, but it, quite frankly, it was all fascinating and fun. I think the other question was, um, who is your favorite engineer? Um, oh, come on. I love so many engineers. Who's well, my? Well, so you can have just one favorite. <laughs> I like a bunch. Penny Packer was amazing for the Penny Packer Bridge. Um, uh, uh, Clifton Burton was uh, an engineer uh, who spent 50 years on one project in uh, Southwest Parkway, uh, which finally got realized after he had retired and before he died. So he was able to be present at the, at the ceremony, opening ceremony of that. Gib Gilchrist, 
just blows my mind. Uh, DeWitt Greer, of course, was a very fine engineer before. I have so many favorite engineers. That's really a very, that's like asking me my favorite book or my favorite child or something. I can't, I can't answer that question. <laughs> John Barton. I thought John Barton. He's yes. fabulous. He's fabulous. And he was, and John Barton was really, really great at seeing the traditional TxDOT engineering culture and what a family TxDOT has always been, and yet making that leap into the that that mental bridge, if you will, between the past and the future for TxDOT before he then retired. So I just got so many favorite engineers. I can't, I can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I I don't see any more questions, so um, I'd like to thank all the branches out there for hosting um, the webinar today um, all over the state. Um, I want to thank again for everybody's participation. As we mentioned, individual registrants should be able to receive and acknowledge without further action an, an attendance. Um, certificate for those attending with the group. The site coordinator will receive the PDH certificates and distribute them. The Texas section will be hosting uh, CCON in 2007 in San Marcos again from September 20th to the 21st. Uh, please visit the section website to review the program and register for the event. In October, the section will be hosting two uh, webinars uh, in in the 2017 series, uh, section 27, concrete culverts of the Ashto um, LRFD bridge construction specification will be presented by Steve Heiner for the Texas from the Texas Concrete Pipe Association on the 10th, and then the in 2017 Texas infrastructure report card will be presented on the 12th that Thursday. Um, I want to invite you to visit the Texas section website and at Texas ASC, well, TEX ASCE org to register for the webinars to learn more about the association and take advantage of the benefits of being an ASCE member. You can also watch the 2016 recorded webinars on demand and earn PDHs. Um, and of course, I'm always here to answer questions and, and Lindsay and her staff over at the Texas section. Um, thank you for attending and I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay and uh, see if she has any concluding comments. Lindsay? Melinda, thank you so much for moderating today's webinar and Carol, thank you for providing an excellent overview of the book and sharing some fun pictures and stories with us. I hope again that those who have not had the chance to read the book will now go out and do so. I think Thank you very I, much for having me. Oh, it's really our pleasure. Um, I do want to say that this was a very well attended webinar for the Texas section. Um, at one point we were up to about 70 attendees and I know that several of that include sites. So we've got multiple people at site. So, so great webinar, great turnout. Very pleased with how it went, and as Melinda mentioned, it'll take us a little bit of time to get the PDH certificates out, but we will do that as quickly as possible. Um, we do have the section's vice president for educational affairs online, Mr. Russell Carter, well, vice president-elect for educational affairs. Um, and I did want to say on his behalf that the section is soliciting topic suggestions for future webinars. So for all of you all listening in, if there's something that you would like to hear about in a webinar, please reach out to the Texas section office and let us know. And with that, this concludes today's webinar. I thank you for joining us and I will now close the session.